Hey guys, Benny Brayton here of Plug It In Hikes and Responsible Stewardship, and you're watching This Week in Backpacking. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to This Week in Backpacking. We're your hosts, Miyagi and Trips, bringing you some of the stories this week in the world of backpacking. Trips, welcome back from Florida. Thank you. Had a fantastic time. Super relaxing, but warm, much too short. Warm weather, good Oh yeah. Good, good weather with yeah. Mrs. Stringer. Yep. Who doesn't want me to call her Mrs. Stringer, Bridget? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was our last backpacking trip we did together? I think it was Pictured Rocks, actually, was wasn't it? That was the last one I did, yeah. Yeah, speaking of Pictured Rocks, there were some boaters out on Lake Superior who witnessed a pretty traumatic event. Yeah. Let's uh, let's check out Pictured Rocks. The views at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore are constantly changing, as one group witnessed on June 26th. Viewer video from John Martin shows a 200-foot cliff face break off and slide into Lake Superior on Saturday afternoon at about 4 p.m. in the area between Miners Beach and Mosquito Beach. Those watching from the pontoon boat said the rock slide created large waves, which caused a slight panic among those who were on the boat. No one was injured, though, as the boat successfully navigated the waves. Martin stated that they could hear the cliff wall popping and cracking, and within 60 seconds, a section of cliff approximately 200 feet wide fell right in front of them. In 2019, a drone photographer captured a similar moment when a slice of the cliff fell into the lake. Officials with the park say that small pieces break away as the soil thaws each year, but giant releases like the one in June or in 2019 are extremely rare and only happen every five years or so. Sue Reese, Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore's Chief of Interpretation, stated that it's just one of those risks with sandstone. It's very soft and always eroding, but it's rare to catch it on film. Trips and I have done numerous trips to Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore and to be in the right place at the right time to capture that where no one got hurt, simply amazing. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Hmm. Well, let's head over to Alvando, Montana now, where there's some tragic news about a fatal grizzly bear attack. A grizzly bear attacked and killed a bicyclist who was camping in a small western Montana town early Tuesday morning. Greg Lemon, a spokesperson with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, said that the pre-dawn attack happened in Alvando, a town about 60 miles northwest of Helena. The bear had wandered into the area where the victim was camping, next to a small post office, and then left. The campers got up and secured the food that had been stored in their tents and then went back to sleep. The bear returned and attacked 65-year-old Leah Davis Loken, pulling her from her tent and killing her. A team of law enforcement and wildlife specialists were brought in to track down and kill the bear. They set several large traps, including one near a chicken coop that was also raided the same night Davis was killed. Investigators obtained DNA left by the bear in the attack and could compare it with any bear that they're able to trap. Grizzly bears have run into increasing conflict with humans in the northern Rockies over the past decade as the federally protected animals expanded into new areas and the number of people living and recreating in the region grew. That has spurred calls from elected officials in Montana and neighboring Wyoming and Idaho to lift protections so the animals can be hunted. People who camp in grizzly bear country, whether deep in the woods or in a developed campground, are advised to keep food and scented products like toothpaste and lip balm away from their campsite at all times. Campers should also cook away from their camp area to avoid lingering cooking and food smells from attracting wildlife. Officials also state that if a bear comes through a campsite, it's important to stay on the lookout for the animal to return. We've put links below in the description of this video for tips and advice on how to help keep you safe in bear country. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Loken's friends and family. We've seen a lot of posts from Appalachian Trail hikers regarding a male who has had very bizarre interactions with hikers and especially seems to target female solo hikers. Most recent information I was able to find was from two days ago when he was seen about one and a half miles north of Snickers Gap, Virginia, close to Bears Den Hostel. Recent information indicates that he may now be in the company of another male. Hikers have stated that he says his name is Mike. He's hiking in blue jeans and boots that are unusual for hiking. He carries a small day pack, but walks around with a hammer. 
He appears to be hiking southbound without food or water. One female hiker who encountered him stated that she stopped to get water near a bridge and Mike proceeded past her and laid down in the middle of the bridge, essentially blocking her forward progress. She discreetly snapped this photo of him. While we don't know that he has any ill will or bad intentions, we feel that people should be aware and remain vigilant of the people in their surroundings. Multiple people have reported him to local police agencies as well as the Park Service. Please be safe out there. Max Patch, the popular grassy bald on the Appalachian Trail known for its picturesque views in Madison County at the Tennessee state line, has some new rules in place. In an announcement July 1st, the Forest Service says the new restrictions, effective immediately, are designed to reduce those impacts to natural resources and protect public health and safety. For years now, Max Patch has been a public dumping ground of cheap camping equipment, toilet paper, human waste, and empty alcohol bottles left behind from a segment of the public who, quite frankly, care more about partying in themselves than leave no trace in protecting the environment. Visitors to Max Patch have been trampling newly planted materials in areas restored for goldwing warbler habitat, and they've even pulled up fence posts for firewood. Another overlooked issue is parking. With cars being parked on both sides of the road, it hinders and sometimes prevents emergency vehicles from accessing communities and their residents. The U.S. Forest Service is prohibiting camping, fires, and more at Max Patch in the Pisgah National Forest for a period of two years, as overcrowding continues to have detrimental impacts on the area. Previous prevention efforts, such as signage, barriers, and fencing, have proved to be completely ineffective. The Carolina Mountain Club even had trail ambassadors that worked tirelessly in an effort to educate the public on Leave No Trace, the need to stay on trails, and not destroy wildlife habitat in the area. But unfortunately, their message has mostly fallen on deaf ears. The rules will stay in effect for two years as the monitoring group made up of U.S. Forest Service personnel, local community members, and other partners continuously monitor visitors and their use and impact on the area. The area will be regularly patrolled by forest rangers and violators will be subject to an $80 to $130 fine for each violation. The restrictions apply to an area surrounding the Appalachian Trail that crosses the Grassy Bald and extends towards Max Patch Road to include the Max Patch Trail. User-created trails connecting the road and the Appalachian Trail are closed. AT through hikers are also prohibited from camping at the site and are encouraged to check with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy on other overnight options nearby. When enjoying the outdoors, it's recommended that we recreate responsibly. In addition to that, it also helps to exercise a little bit of responsible stewardship and let's not forget leave no trace. You know, if we follow all these guidelines, the impact on our public lands and green spaces will be minimized. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today, is how we can do that in a more responsible manner. And maybe what role we have to play as media creators and maybe even media consumers. But let's talk about responsible stewardship real quick. Responsible stewardship, it's much more than recreating responsibly or even leave no trace. Responsible stewardship is education through action. And what I mean by that is instead of complaining and waiting on someone else to come along and fix the problem, why not take action and do it yourself? Or maybe lead an effort or inspire an effort to do something. A great example of this is Max Patch and the Smokies how they've seen overwhelming numbers of visitors, some visitors mistreating the location severely. And instead of waiting for departments to come in and clean up areas and different things like that, organizations like Save Our Smokies has stepped in and said, no, we're doing this now. And since the first of the year, 2021, Save Our Smokies has removed over four and a half tons of litter off the roadsides of the Smokies. And they've not even covered all the roads yet. That's people coming together for the betterment of public lands. And Max Patch is no different. Max Patch is now under a two-year ban of no camping and no campfires because people were mistreating it. But other people came to the rescue and fought for Max Patch and lobbied for that ban. Now, whenever it comes to digitally sharing a location, whether you're using a geotag or a hashtag, there's a level of responsibility that we hold there as well. Now, one of the things I like to recommend people do is just take a minute and consider the following. Does the infrastructure actually support additional visitors? 
Are there adequate roads? Parking? Is there enough restrooms? Is there enough trash receptacles for people to throw away their trash? If your answer is to no to any of that, then that's your answer to whether you should geotag or hashtag that location. We also need to consider our human and environmental impact that we're placing on the ecosystem of that location. We can share, but we can do it in a responsible manner. Now, since I don't personally geotag or hashtag specific locations, I get a lot of questions of people asking me, hey, where is this place? Whenever I'm making a post. And what this does is opens up an opportunity for me to have that conversation of responsible stewardship and leave no trace. It gives me an opportunity to talk to the individual about the special needs for that particular location, whether it be uh, certain areas are being rehabilitated, uh, maybe there's no restrooms or trash receptacles, so I'm telling people to plan ahead. Maybe the parking is limited, or maybe there's an entrance fee. I help those people understand the responsibility that they're taking on whenever they go to this location. And I encourage them to do the same. I encourage them to not geotag it or hashtag it, especially if it's a location that has seen very negative impacts due to social media, kind of like MaxPatch. I encourage you to do the same thing. Take the time to have that conversation with people. I'm going to leave you with this. If we change the way we view public lands, it will change the way we use public lands. Carbon County authorities in Montana are searching for a hiker missing in the Custer Gallatin National Forest who has not been heard from since Thursday, July 1st. Red Lodge Search and Rescue and the Carbon County Sheriff's Office are working to locate 23-year-old Tatum Tate Morrell, an experienced hiker who set out from the West Fork Trailhead the afternoon of Thursday, July 1st to climb five mountain peaks in the Rock Creek drainage. Her plan was to scale Whitetail Peak, Castle, Bowback, Sundance, and Beartooth Mountains, each over 12,000 feet. Her plan was to complete the trip by Monday, July 5th. Around 8 p.m. Thursday, Tate used Garmin InReach GPS to check in with her mother from a tent she pitched along Shadow Lake. The lake is situated just north of Whitetail Peak, about 21 miles northeast of Yellowstone National Park's northernmost boundary. Tate hasn't been heard from since that communication with her mother. Red Lodge Fire and Rescue say that Tate is an experienced hiker and most likely left her tent Friday morning in the Shadow Lake area to hike up one of the closer 12,000-foot peaks in the area. All possible routes she could have taken to access the peaks are high elevation and relatively technical, with car-sized boulders, scree, and snow fields. We have searched the rugged mountains west of Red Lodge, um, both from the air and on the ground. We've utilized uh, multiple helicopter platforms and high-tech technologies uh, to try and locate her. Um, four dog teams uh, scoured the area uh, trying to find any sign of her inserted multiple mountain and alpine rescue teams into the, the rugged mountains uh, and were unable to locate any sign of Tate. We will continue the searching over the next several weeks, utilizing dog teams and aircraft uh, with hopes of finding her. So that story coming off the AT, kind of scary, that suspicious man. One of our uh, trail correspondents, Hunter Musgrove, is actually on trail right now in the area that that man is in, and I contacted him, talked with Hunter yesterday, and he stated that there was approximately 10 other female hikers who had witnessed similar activities, similar suspicious activities from this guy, uh, but they state that they think that the guy has actually gotten off trail. However, that doesn't mean he's gonna stay off trail. So make sure if you see any suspicious activity like that, report it to the authorities and let other fellow hikers know. It's important that we stay safe together as a community. Yes, if you guys uh, find value in these stories, please consider subscribing to the channel and sharing with other hikers within the community about the channel. And hit that bell notification. <laughs> While you're at it. Speaking of which, uh, Hyperlite Mountain Gear has a brand new piece of equipment. It's to keep your camera equipment safe. So let's check out Hyperlite Mountain Gear's new camera pod.
Introducing Hyperlight Mountain Gear's new camera pod. One could argue that a camera isn't a necessary item among the list of equipment that constitutes the backcountry essentials. But we understand that for many of you, like us, documenting the transformative places you visit isn't only desirable, it's an absolute passion. With the same level of design intention and construction quality as their packs, shelters, and accessories, the Camera Pod is Hyperlight Mountain Gear's answer to your quest for an ultralight, durable, and weatherproof camera carrying solution. Built with a selection of Dyneema composite fabrics that offer the best performance and protection with an incredibly low overall weight, you can keep the focus on the shot you're after and know that your photography equipment is just as secure as all your other gear. Available in two sizes, the regular, coming in at just 2.71 ounces, fits most smaller mirrorless and point-and-shoot cameras like the Sony A6000 series, Canon EOS M6, and Sony RX100. The large size comes in at 3.73 ounces and fits larger mirrorless cameras like the Sony A7 series, Nikon Z series, or Canon EOS R. Check the link below we have for Hyperlight Mountain Gear's new camera pod. I hear Milos filled in while I was on vacation. <laughs> he did, and boy, boy, he's such a character, that he Milos. He certainly is. <laughs> but he, uh, he's back for world news this week, and he still has islands on the brain, and he told me that he's going to be taking us to another island. What's the chance, Trips, to, there's palm trees involved this time? Probably somewhere between Slim and Nunn. <laughs> Probably not. Let's check in with Milos and see what he's got up his sleeve this week. Thank you for watching World News with Milos. This week in the backpack, I'm gonna have hike Greenland. If you are go Greenland, bring a dollar and maybe bring a dog. Milo, give me a. Ah, this dog. You can bring her. If you don't have one dog, you bring Lilo. Okay, we go, come on. For some reason, Milos have an island on the brain. Lately, I think island, I want to go. This time I go for Greenland. Greenland about 80% covered in ice. So I pick what? Arctic Circle Trail. Arctic Circle Trail, good place for lonely hike, good place for solitude, and good place for reflection of yourself. Although I get a little bit of discrepancy when the people are telling you how long is the trail, ACT, Arctic Circle Trail, about 103 miles American, 165 kilometer. If you go for this hike, maybe 7 of 10 days of trek in the barren yet beautiful countryside, Western Greenland, 40 to 50 kilometer north of Arctic Circle. Milos give you elevation change about 13,465 feet up, down, up, down, maybe side, side if you are going around muddy spot, which is why you probably want to go between uh, June and September. But be careful, this is gonna be a time for you gonna get Arctic Mosquito, the Arctic Mosquito, Arctic Mosquito. Which is why Milo's gonna give a recommendation, bring the bog net, make sure you don't get bit by Arctic Mosquito. Don't worry about water on trail, very plentiful, all along trail, which is probably why they get the Arctic Mosquito. Section of this hike broken up with hut or cottage you can take shelter overnight because temperature will drop pretty close to below zero. Sometime, depending on when you are go. You can see the Arctic Fox, a hare. You can see reindeer, but no Santa Claus. So go for House of Pain, pack it up, pack it in, because when you begin at the Kangarlasuak, not very good place to get supply or thing you're gonna need for a hike. If you're gonna see the rare, very rare muskox, or even rarer than the muskox, the polar bear, take picture with the camera on the phone, but don't try to send it to your body friend. No cell service along this trail, which ends in Sisimut, Greenland, Beautiful. This is gonna be world news with Milos. Maybe next time we're not gonna be on an island. Back to you, Miyagi, and back to your trips. Welcome home. 
The Arctic Circle Trail. Now, Trips, that's one that's on my bucket list. What do you think? Can I think we, it'd be amazing. Can we put it on there? Sure. What about the mosquitoes? They'll probably carry me away, <laughs> but I'm willing to chance it. They probably will. She doesn't like mosquitoes, so. They love me. They do love her, and that's that's my superpower. I don't uh, I don't mind mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I had a chance to check in with this week's through hiker. He's actually currently taking a zero in Leadville, Colorado. Let's check in with the Flash and see what he's up to. In 2019, Trips and I had the pleasure of meeting and hiking with an accomplished thru-hiker in the Red River Gorge. Brian the Flash Carpenter is no stranger to long-distance trails. In 2012, Flash thru-hiked the AT and caught the long-distance hiking bug. Among his long list of accomplishments, Flash thru-hiked the Sheltui Trace in 2018, the Speria Hiking Trail in 2020, and is currently on pace at this very moment to complete a thru-hike of the Colorado Trail. Let's check in with Flash and see how he's doing. Well, thank you, Trips and Miyagi. My name is Brian Carpenter on the trail I'm known as The Flash, and right now I am sitting 143 miles in on the Colorado Trail in Leadville. And if I could sum up this trail in two words, it would be number one, challenging, and number two, breathtaking. Um, some of these climbs have been, have been butt kickers, but uh, the payoff at the top, um, go, coming up over passes like Georgia Pass and Kokomo Pass, have been unlike anything I've experienced. Um, the trail is simply breathtaking. It's fantastic. Uh, it'll kick your ass. But overall, man, I'm so glad I'm out here and can't wait to see what the next 340-ish miles um, turn out to be. Um, if you haven't had a chance to get out to uh, Colorado or hit up the Colorado Trail, definitely add it to your list. You will not be disappointed. Thank you guys for having me on here and I uh, hope to give you guys an update again pretty soon. Thanks for that update, Flash. If you haven't had a chance to see his awesome photos from this trip, make sure to check him out and subscribe to him on Instagram. He can be found at Carpetac, and he's currently posting all kinds of awesome photos from his Colorado thru-hike. Off the trail, Flash is a brilliant small business owner, the creative talent behind Smoky Trail Signs with his company Carpenter Family Woodworking. Specializing in recreating trail signs from the Smoky Mountains, he's expanded to specializing in signs from other trails around the nation as well, and was recently even commissioned to make some official signage for the North Country Trail. Check out Flash's work by visiting his website at www.carpenter-works.com. Flash Colorado looks amazing. We wish you luck on the end of your journey, and hopefully we get a chance to check in with you again before the end of your trip. If you get a chance, make sure you check out The Flash on all of his social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, check out his business, uh, Smoky Trail Signs. And this is an example of his work. Trips had this made for me. This is an Appalachian Trail sign from the Smoky Mountains. Our family had a chance to check out this actual sign on the Appalachian Trail, and this is a recreation of that. And you can check this out and many more signs on his website. That's awesome. Thank you, Trips, for that. So check him out on the web. That's going to do it, guys, this week for this week in backpacking. If you get a chance, make sure you hit that bell notification and the... Uh, you know, click on it so that we can send you a freshly hatched brood of Arctic mosquitoes. <laughs> if you have any segments or you want to just drop us a line, this week in backpacking at gmail.com. Other than that, that's going to wrap it up. Guys, thanks again for joining along, and we will see you next week on This Week in Backpacking. Take care. <laughs>